Okay, I'm going to start recording this. And if that wasn't even enough, I'm going to start us live on Facebook as I share on my timeline, share in a group, share on a page I manage. There's so many little steps that you have to go through to do this. It's just amazing. Whoops. Okay. Preparing live streaming video preview. That's what's happening right now as we get ready to rock and roll through this. Okay. This has been a real science project doing this. <laughs> okay. Go live, go live. Oops, had a time bomb. Okay, sorry to take so long, but it takes a long time. You know what I mean? Okay. Live producer. Setting up your meeting for Facebook Live. This is what I'm usually doing when other people are talking. So I'm trying to get this over with right now. So when I start, we can have a nice smooth thing going on. Okay, so here we go. I think we are live. Let me just confirm. All right. It seems to be working. Let me just look at that. Okay, goody. We're on. Baruch Hashem. Okay. All right, okay, here we go. All right, now I'm back and paying total attention to all of you, okay, hold on. There I am, hello. Okay, we're gonna start right now, welcome. Hi, shalom alechem. <laughs> Chesky and Mike, hi. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm muting everyone just in case you have your, your microphone on. And um, I will ask that after, if you have questions, which I'm sure you will, you should wait till pretty much after, and then I'll go through all the questions because the thing about this kind of a presentation is there's gonna be a lot of questions. And if we go down one segue, we'll never get to the end of the story. So if you be patient, I will take your questions. And not only that, I will, um, try to preempt some of your questions actually as I am working on this presentation with you. Um, so, okay, everybody is muted. I am speaking. I am gonna share my screen with you so you can see my presentation, which hopefully you'll be able to see and love. Okay, share screen. Okay, Hine. Okay, let's see. Transitions animation slideshow. All right, so this is the thing. As I am talking and speaking here on my screen, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can see the whole screen. On my screen, I see part of it and also a whole box with a whole bunch of of your faces. So I'm just hoping that everybody is seeing the whole screen and not also the box that I'm seeing with everybody's faces, which is interrupting like part of the screen. So if that is true, wave your hands so I know that it's true. Yeah, it's true. Thank you. Okay, very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is, this is a presentation that is partially academic and scholarly, partially spiritual and 
um, Kabbalistic. It's a kind of a amalgam of the two, and it comes from my own research and my own professional experience for almost the last 40 years of being a professional astrologer. So just a small background and what this means, Yesh Mazal Yisrael. This is insights into Chodesh Nisan, which is the month that we're in right now, and the zodiac sign of Aries, Tale the Lamb or, or Ram, given by me, Laura Likud, in case you didn't know who was speaking to you right now. It's sort of a joke on a Talmudic phrase that says, Ein Mazali Yisrael. Ein means none. There is none. It's translated as there is no Mazal. Mazal is the Hebrew word that technically means constellation. But what they are saying here, there is no constellation or zodiac sign that has power over Israel, meaning corporate Israel, the entire klal, the corp corporate idea of the people of Israel. Says this in the Talmud and then goes on to give you a whole bunch of examples of why that isn't true, actually, as the Talmud does. Okay, so my title of this is Yesh, which means there is. There is, in fact, Mazal Israel. Because why? Because there is. And we see that in so many ways. And this brings me to the most important question, which started me off way back when, when I first moved to Israel in 2007. I'd been a professional astrologer for some time and I moved there and I started to tell people that I did astrology and it was like a sore, a sore, which means forbidden, forbidden. People told me this is, um, you know, it's not kosher, it's not right. And these are religious people, basically Haredim or, or what non-observant non people would call ultra-Orthodox people would tell me that it's forbidden, and it says so in the Shulchan Aruch, which is the book of Jewish law, one must not inquire of the astrologers and not consult lots. L remember that later, because we'll get back to that, because the word there, lots, is poor, like Purim, right? It's this deep secret there. And yet, we have that, and yet, illustrated over here by this synagogue floor from the fifth century, in the northern part of Israel, we have the entire zodiac. This is a very, very famous zodiac floor, a, a mosaic tile floor. And we know and we see, and it's evidenced everywhere we go, that astrological motifs in art and artifacts, household items, ritual objects, ephemera, and Jewish texts from antiquity through the modern age suggests, in fact, demonstrates that astrology was a common and normative component in the lives of Jewish communities. And how do we know this? So just using Aries, the month that we're in, as an example, here are some pictures that we have. This is Aries the Lamb from the Michael Maxor. It's an illuminated parchment manuscript. Germany, 1258, way before the modern era, there was no you can't say that um, there was there was such a thing as the reform movement or anything modern in Germany in 1258. This is called medieval Ashkenaz, and yet you see astrological motifs being used in holy things like books. We have Aries Mazal Tale from a Torah binder, which is made of silk embroidered on linen from Germany in 1858. Over here, it's a beautiful example. And this is also Mazal Tale. This says Nisan, see? And you see, you see the lamb carrying a flag there that says Mazal Tale. It's from another a Torah binder, watercolor on linen, Germany, 1802. So this is, these are quite old examples. Um, here we have from the Passover Haggadah in 1769, this whole motif about Chodesh Nisan. You see over here the, the lamb or the, the ram in the sky, sort of interesting, kind of trippy, if you ask me, I like it. Um, this from Prague, Prague, 1661, Aries in a Moxor. And of course, the really, really famous example is the Sefer Evra Note. It was a book written um, in 1527, and this illustration is a reproduction of it that was done in Halberstadt, Germany in 1716. These are all images of 
Aries. Okay, so it's entirely obvious from this example, these examples alone, that holy things were used, that, that images and astrological imagery was used on the Cynthia, can you mute yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we see this in the beautiful, gorgeous, wooden, painted wooden synagogues in Eastern Europe, which I would love to visit in real life, and they're, of course, been reproduced. Um, this is between the mid-16th and 17th century. Of course, there's calendars that all the households had, tons of it. This really blew my mind. This was a Torah crown from the Ukraine, 1845, had the entire zodiac on it. This is the part that has to do with Aries. Um, so my, my remark about this is that there's no way to say that astrology was not a normative part of Jewish cultural life when everything, all of these examples, and these, this is just a drop in the bucket of thousands and thousands of examples that we have, um, was everywhere around the people as they lived. So there's no way to say that it wasn't part of life. So, so what? So what are we? How are we supposed to understand how how that works in terms of our life? Okay. So there's a beautiful poem, and it made I was thinking of it this week because there's a Israeli artist Yishai Rabo who makes beautiful, beautiful music, and he just did something Keter Malchut. It's a, his own take of it. But this is a very, very well-known poem that is still recited by Sephardic Jews on Yom Kippur. And it's all about, there's huge sections of it that are about the zodiac. There's the, the certain sections are a very uh, in-depth description devoted to the individual planets, Mercury, Venus, the Sun and Moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, etc. And that's crazy, right? So we sing that on Yom Kippur. If you're Sephardi, you still sing that on Yom Kippur. And of the Zodiac itself, Keter Malchut has this beautiful description. You have encompassed the sphere of Saturn with an eighth sphere of encompassment, and it is laden with the 12 constellation on the line of the belt of its ephod and the, all the higher stars of the cloud land fixed in its rigidity. This is a crazy translation, but anyway, I think you see where I'm going here. So not only in art and artifacts, but in actual worship service. And in the Torah, we have my most favorite example. This is from Bamidbar, Numbers chapter two. It is a description of God's instructions, so to speak, to Moses um, and Aaron explaining how the 12 tribes should camp around the tabernacle or the mishkan as it is called in hebrew during their wanderings in the desert he specifically told them it needs to be in a certain configuration and no other yehuda is always to the east ephraim is always to the west dan is always to the north reuben's always to the south the other tribes arrayed around them all with their degalim, their flags, and the mishkan in the middle, the mishkan, the tabernacle. Do you see how I'm moving my mouse around to show you and illustrate how it's a miniaturized, as above, so below, actual reflection of the celestial sphere, the ecliptic, the zodiac, that is this invisible imaginary belt that goes around the waist, so to speak, the equator of the of the tropical equator of the planet Earth that we project this idea that there's 360 degrees of the zodiac going around this entire thing and this whole thing is divided up into 360 degrees and the sun is in the middle the tabernacle the mishkan is in the middle and the tribes are arrayed around it now why was it so important for for the the tribes and the people to be in that position over and over again. It says at the end of Bamidbar, it tells us that the children of Israel encamped in this exact position 42 times 
over the 40 years of their wandering in the desert. 42 times they rehearsed this shape, this sacred shape. This, this is the mandala, so to speak, the power, the power configuration of the Jewish people as they were arrayed around their power base the Mishkan, which was the spiritual technology that they used to worship their God in the desert before they entered the promised land. And you see that also in this view here, you see the sun, the earth are revolving around the sun and the belt, so to speak, of the zodiac, how it works and the pole of the ecliptic going straight up and down through it. But of course, we are slightly skewed so we're going to talk a little bit now about Nisan, the month of Nisan, Aries, the zodiac sign of Aries, Tale, the lamb. The Sefer Yetzirah tells us that Nisan was created with the letter He. Okay? The ruling attribute is the power of speech. And Nisan is the birth of the creation of the world, allegedly occurred during Nisan, the conception of the world occurred during Tishrei. This is from Rosh Hashanah 27a, the Tosafot on that, although there is, of course, because we are Jewish, an opposing viewpoint that says the birth of the creation of the world occurred in Tishrei and the conception of the world in thought occurred during Kodesh Nisan. So it depends on where you hold on that, but either or, you begin to see there the balance between these two east-west energetic paradigms, Nisan and Tishrei. And so what does that remind us of? These major Chagim, the full moon of Nisan and the full moon of Chodesh Tishrei, which is Sukkot. So on one side of the Jewish year, you have Chodesh Nisan and the full moon in Libra, Aries Libra. And then on the other side of the Jewish year, you have the full moon of Chodesh Tishrei, which is Libra full moon in Aries. So Aries Libra, Libra Aries, holding up the Jewish year like that on the east-west axis. And of course, Aries is ruled by Mars and, and, and Tishrei Libra is ruled by Venus. So you have the Venus, Mars, Mars, Venus paradigm as well. Okay, so what happens during Nisan, the big event, Pesach? Pesach, the mouse speaks. This refers, of course, to the recital of the Haggadah, telling over the story of our exodus from Egypt. And the element of Chodesh Nisan is fire, which of course reminds us of sacrifice, the Passover lamb. It's also the new year for kings, Chodesh Nisan, and the dating of financial documents is also done from Chodesh Nisan. Okay, so the Avi Netzer, tells us that Aries the lamb symbolizes the unity of the collective because a flock of lambs each feels itself identical with the other. I'm sure you've heard the expression, they're just a bunch of sheeple, right? They're a bunch of sheeple because they all, they're like sheep. They all, they all think alike. They, they don't think of themselves as individuals. They think of themselves as part of the crowd. Also, just as sheep follow the shepherd, the Jewish people accepted the authority of Moses. The Passover lamb sacrifice is a unification ritual for the Jewish people. That is one of the thoughts about it. So I think that's a very high view of Aries the lamb symbolizing the unity of the collective because Aries also is the head and it corresponds to the head in the cosmic body. This is an uh, example of astrology used in medicine called medical melothesia. And this is an example of the Jewish Zodiac man. And how do we know he's Jewish? Because he is circumcised. One of the few examples of circumcised Zodiac man that are available from our medieval text sources. So it is known that in medieval times and even to this present day that there are body parts associated with planets and constellations. And the healing is accompanied by the drawing down of spiritual power by the use of amulets, said below, right? So Aries is the ruler of the head. So if the head is the, is the, the head is the head of the body. Aries is the head of the 12 tribes. It's the head of the 12 permutations of the Zodiac that 
Kabbalah understands that the zodiac is divided into 12 signs and each of the 12 signs corresponds to a month and each of the month corresponds to one of the 12 ways you can arrange the holy letters of the divine name, which is, are these four letters, the Yud and the He and the Vav, which connects the upper He to the lower He. This is the lower He. So Aries is Yud, He, Vav, He, the way we normally understand that name. But then when you go to Taurus, the next sign, it's Yud, He, He, Vav. And then Gemini, Yud, Vav, He, He. So you see, it goes all the way around. All 12 signs have their own sacred mix up of the letters, so to speak, that all Kabbalists trip on and go off on these various permutations, which get into extreme gematria, dikuda, which I am so not going to go there. And you can thank me now or later for that because it will really give you a headache. But the kids are, and just to summarize it, Yud and He and Vav and He, the way that we normally see the divine name when it is written in, let's say, the Torah, is the permutation of those letters for the month of Nisan and the sign of Aries. Okay, so the Hebrew for Mars, the planet that rules Aries, is Ma'adim, which is translated that which is reddens or makes red from the root Aleph Dalid Mem. This is a final Mem. Mars is the ruling planet of Aries and Nisan, and Mars in classical astrology was understood as a planet of judgment or din. The nation of Egypt was judged at the height of Chodesh Nisan, which is Passover, which is the full moon of Nisan, while the Jewish people who put the blood of the lamb on the lintels and the doorposts of their homes were saved from this particular kind of din or judgment. The Bnei Yisachar in his discourse on Chodesh Nisan teaches us that the nations most affected by the sign of Aries are Israel and the Arab countries. In fact, Aries being the firstborn, so to speak, of the astrological constellations was the sign of the ancient ancient Egyptians, the most powerful god of that time. I'm sorry, the most powerful nation of that time. At the height of their constellation's influence, at the 15th day of the lunar month, when Egypt was deriving the most power from its ruling planet, the Jewish people were delivered from them. This expresses the fact that the Jewish nation is, is under divine rule. Okay, so a negative aspect of Aries is pride and dictatorship, and these characteristics were also seen, of course, legendarily in Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So each of the 12 tribes, as everybody knows, has a tribal ruler assigned to them, and Yehuda is the tribal ruler of Aries and the month of Nisan. Upon the birth of Yehuda, his mother Leah, our matriarch, said, this time I shall praise God. So the idea of Yehuda is praise, right? Yehuda in, in, in I'm going to say rabbinic and midrashic thought is thought of as the master of repentance. He's the archetype for the Baal Teshuvah. This is based on he, his behavior, how he publicly repented of his actions and enacted righteous judgments on his own self in the matter of Tamar, as described in Genesis 38. This is actually my birth Parsha. Um, so Yehuda the, uh, goes down and he marries this woman. All these things happen to him, blah, blah, blah. He ends up having carnal relationships, so to speak, with his daughter-in-law, who he doesn't recognize because she's dressed up as a prostitute. And she lures him into having sex with her so she can get pregnant because Yehuda wasn't doing the right thing. He was supposed to be giving his sons to her according to the arranged marriage situation of that time. And because he was withholding the possibility of her getting pregnant, she had to take matters into her own hands. And when she turned up pregnant, the townspeople were like, we're gonna burn her at the stake. And Yehuda said, yeah, and I'm gonna light the fire. Let me see that woman. <laughs> so, 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 so tomorrow, 
still hasn't told everybody that that Yehuda is the father of her children, and she holds out his staff and his signet ring, these things that identify his power and his authority in terms of his family and his status. And, and she says the person who's, who belongs, these belongings belong to is the person who, who is the father of my child. And he recognizes them as his own. And he publicly repents at this point and says, this woman is righteous. Take her down off the stake. We're not going to burn her. It's all my fault, et cetera. To summarize, he takes personal responsibility for his own moral failings and does what needs to be done to correct them. This is why he is the archetype for the Baal Teshuvah, somebody who turns back from their behavior and wants to follow a path of righteousness. And he, even though he was the fourth born, fourth born naturally of his mother and father, Leah and Yaakov, he became the leader of the 12 tribes after his older brothers are each disqualified from the leadership position because of their behavior. Firstborn Reuben gets knocked off because he moved his father's bed and he was too emotional. He's of course the sign of Aries, ruled by water. Then Shimon and Levi went on a massacre in Shechem to avenge the rape of their sister Dina. So later on in the story when Jacob is giving his blessings to the 12 tribes. He's disqualifying the two of them from the leadership position because of their anger. And of course, then um, the Levites, Levi and his family, go on to become the priestly family. So even though Yehuda rules Aries and Aries is the lamb, Yehuda's sigil, the, 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 the symbol, the, his symbol, on his flag in the desert was a lion, right? The tribe of Shimon, which is the tribal ruler of the zodiac sign of Leo, which is called Arie, Arie the lion, doesn't have a lion on it. It features the gates of Shechem. Shechem is a town that, that Shimon and his brother destroyed in revenge for the rape of their, his, their sister. That's what's on the, the um, flag of, of Shimon, but Yehuda, gets the lion because he's the lion in this situation. That's also the logo of Jerusalem. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you see lions everywhere on top of uh, buildings and on, on, on potholes everywhere. It's the lion is uh, the symbol of Judah and Judea because that's where Jerusalem is located in the place of Judea. And Yehuda, of course, is the tribe of King David. Um, kingdom is the foundation of the month. You understand that it's a play on words. Lechem, like this month, the month of Nisan shall be to, for you Lechem, the head of all months. So you rearrange Lechem and you get Melech, king. So it's explained that, of course, that King David's name has to do with humility and humbleness. This is from uh, Mattis Yahu Blazerson, by the way, above the Zodiac, and it gives a little play on some of the letters in the divine name and Kings David. So there you have another seeming contradiction that all works together, though, because Yehuda is Aries, and it's Aries, and Yehuda is the tribe of King David. It's the tribe that Mashiach, Messiah, is supposed to come from. And at the same time, there's the idea of being humble. And full of humility, which is what happens when the sign of Aries reaches its most refined state. When Aries, Aries energy is worked with consciously within a person, they're able to really refine themselves and become powerfully humble, okay? Powerful like Aries and humble at the same time. So here's a question I'm going to ask for you on your behalf. Why does my horoscope say I'm an Aries when I was born during Kodesh Adar or during Kodesh Iyar for that reason? Okay, so there's this idea of solar Aries. This is the sun transiting through Aries through the ecliptic. Happens about from March 21st through April 19th, depending on where you are in the world, okay? Because what time, day, international date line, blah, 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 okay? But Kodesh Nisan, the start date varies by whichever, whatever's happening in whatever year we are in the 19-year metonic cycle. So 
a person, but the one thing that we know about the Jewish calendar, it is set up, the entire thing is set up so that no matter what happens, the month of Nisan has to come in the spring. That's why we're a solar lunar calendar, not a lunar lunar calendar, like let's say the Islamic calendar that is completely lunar and runs backwards. So the month of Ramadan is in the same month for three years and then goes backwards a sign, okay? We have to make sure all the time, no matter what else happens, that we have Passover in the spring. Have to have it in the spring, so that's why we have to do tricky things to the, cal to the cal calendar to in intercalculate it to make sure that we have it in the spring. So for instance, in Nissan, this year goes from March 26th to April 23rd. Last year, March 6th through May 4th. May 4th already, you're into, into Taurus, right? So you see just from these examples right here that Nissan, the month, and Aries don't always overlap. So people born after Rosh Chodesh Nissan but before solar Aries start, they're Nissan Pisces. They're Pisces because they're still in um, solar Pisces, but they're born during the month of Nissan. And a person is born after Rosh Chodesh ER, but before the end of solar Aries is an ER Aries. And a person born while the sun is still in Aries during Chodesh Nissan is a plain old regular Nissan Aries. So one way you can tell it, wh it, where you are in the month is by the full moon, because the full moon of Hodesh Nisan, as with all full moons, always happens during the same sign, but during, the, during the, the Hodesh. So you don't get a full moon in one month. During the, you don't get a full moon in the wrong month. So the full moon of Nisan always happens during Aries, because the moon is always full in the sign opposite wherever the sun is. That's how full moons work, people. Opposites. Um, Aries is a cardinal sign of the, of the three modalities, cardinal, fixed, and mutable. Cardinal initiates things. It's a cardinal fire sign, so fire is inspiration. So Aries initiates inspiration, as we've talked about, the ram and the lamb. Its archetype is the warrior, and the shadow side is the destroyer, because Mars can be very destructive, right? Typical things that you hear in astrology about Mars and about, about Aries, energetic, individual, spontaneous, impulsive, direct, dynamic, impatient, in a big rush, got that daredevil energy, pioneering, headstrong individual. Many times you will see Aries people in medicine, surgery, sports, anything having to do with martial things, right? Here's a little illustration of Aries from a Seder plate in 1825, artist unknown. Um, in the Talmud, in Shabbat 156a, in the Babylonian Talmud, the rabbis are talking about rising signs. They're saying, no, 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 it's not the day that a person was born in, the planetary ruler of the day, that's important. We understand astrology. We think that it's the hour of the day that you were born in. So what does that mean? So at every hour of the day, uh, uh, there is a plant, there is a constellation rising on the easternmost horizon of wherever you are on the earth. So wherever you are on the earth right now, if you take an invisible plumb line and stick it out straight east, due east, you're gonna hit one of the 360 degrees of the zodiac. That is what is quote unquote rising on the east, okay? This is what they're talking about by the hour. It says not the constellation of the day, but the hour is the determining influence. They go on and on about these characteristics. He who is born under Mars will be a shedder of blood. Rob Ashi observed either a surgeon, a thief, a slaughterer, or a circumciser. Rabba said, I was born under Mars, and Abai, I don't know how to say that, Abai retorted, You too inflict punishment and kill. And here's a picture of Aries on the ceiling of the great yeshiva in Meisharim, the home of ultra-orthodoxy in Jerusalem. This photo is from 1939. Okay, the Talmud attributes a bad-tempered personality to those born on a Monday under Mars, Monday being under Mars, Mars being, of course, the planetary ruler of Aries, and 
explains it by the actions taken by God on the second day of creation, during which the waters were divided. So the astrological reason for associating Monday with strife and anger is because the second day of the week is associated with the planet. Mars, the ruler of the zodiac sign of Aries, right, is the one that's associated with Monday in the planetary rulerships of the Jewish tradition, which are different than the Greek ones. So in Greek, in the Greek or Hellenistic tradition, Monday is thought of moon day, but we Monday is not the moon by us. Monday is Mars, okay? So Mars, the energy of aggression, assertiveness, strife, anger, conflict, passion. It's really the yetzer, not tov or ra, just that ra, chi, that life energy. As the waters were divided on the second day, the forceful energy of Mars creates a division. This I found really interesting. The Hebrew for Mars, ma'adin, from Aleph, Dalit, Mem, Adam, right? Contrast, King David, who was ruddy and he was legendarily a redhead or gingy. So there's this idea of red. Adom, which was the inheritance of Aesop, who was called red, and he traded his birthright for a bowl of red lentils. And of course, Adama, Earth. All of these make us, this is all associated with the same letters as the word for Mars. So there's this life force that can either be fallen or rectified. This is, these are Kabbalistic ideas, right? falling and rectifying things, the fallen sparks and the rectification, the finding and raising up to holiness, those sparks. So here's a little something about, from Eben Ezra, about astrology and the Aries Libra paradigm here. I'm going like this with my mouse, so hopefully you can see how Aries and Libra are opposite each other in this picture. And over here, you have a picture of the breastplate of the high priest and the ephod that he wore, which was like a shoulder strap that kept this breastplate on his breast, which also contained these special objects for divination. So Ibn Ezra, <coughs> the great commentator, was an astral magical commentator. He understood Torah through the lens of astrology and he wrote about it. Okay? He wrote about what he perceived as the very deep secret behind the ephod and the breastplate. He's only going to allude to part of it. He's not going to give the whole thing over. Perhaps if you're smart enough, as he says, if you know the mind of the Most High, you'll understand it. The following are the keys to the secret of the ephod. The two wreathen chains on the two rings up here represent the head of Aries, Tale, and the Libra, Mosnaim. The band of the ephod represents the celestial equator. Hence, six names were inscribed on the stone, which was on the other shoulder. So on the stones that are on the shoulders of the ephod are six and six, the children of Israel, six and six like the zodiac above and below. And they're held together by Aries and Libra, which I said before, are the east-west axis of the earth and the sky and the whole thing. So this is this is an important insight. Um, this is this ha has to do with also making sure that Passover only comes in the spring, and how Ibn Ezra understood that the instruments of the high priest to be astrological and keeping Pesach on track. It's supposed to always happen in the spring, and Ibn Ezra understood the outfit itself of the high priest having embedded in it these clues about the zodiac and the times and the understanding of times to keep Passover where it was supposed to be, okay? So this is the cycle of sacred time known as the Jewish year. These are all of the, see how it's arranged like what it is, which is a circle, not a square, just like the children of Israel were camped in a circle and not a square. Sorry, all of you commentators, but when we get to Olam Abba, it's going to be like, oh, she was right. You're going to stand in line. <laughs> um, anyway, the Mishkan in the middle, this is, a, this is sort of a picture of the human personality as well. And then to the east, Yehuda, to the west, Ephraim, all of the associations of the different um, tribes, their ruling planets, their elements who they were the 
child of and what birth order they're in and the various holidays that fall in those months. So I'm gonna have this whole presentation up for you to download and look at on your own time. So maybe if you wanna take a closer look at it, but you can see how, as we were talking about before, Yehuda and Ephraim, Mars and Venus, this dynamic tension between these two important points. And of course, this has everything to do with Passover and later on in the year, Shavuot, right? So just to let you know about your own self, you need to understand that everybody has all 12 zodiac signs in their personal natal chart. So it has nothing to do with whether or not you're in Aries. You have Aries, whether you're in Aries, your son is in Aries or not, okay? So the whatever, whatever um, house of the 12 houses of your natal chart is ruled by Aries is where you have that Yehuda energy, right? That fresh energy, that Mars energy. And that's where the Yehuda energy is manifested in your life. So just to have a fun example of someone who's not, whoops, not a person, but a country, I chose the United States just randomly. I was going to choose a human, but I thought it would be better to do a country. Um, this is an example of the United States of America's natal chart using a simple version without a lot of asteroids and using whole signs. Aries is the ruler of the fifth house. Fifth house is creativity and it indicates what is created, like children are creations. Um, if you're a writer, your books are your creations. If you're a painter, your paintings are your creations. It's things you, you create. It's also romantic love, so to speak, something that's created. America's fifth house is ruled by Mars and Aries. America has Chiron, the asteroid that's called the wounded healer in Aries in the fifth house. That's a free, a free form interpretation. We romanticize war, Mars. Our children are our soldiers, fifth house. We imagine ourselves to be brave and courageous, that's Aries. We create leadership and we valorize it. We're aggressive and assertive people as Americans, and we take the initiative in all things that we create. As we like to say here in America, we're number one, and that's where we get it from, okay? So just gonna talk a little bit here about this Chodesh Nisan that we're in right now today is, oh my God, I don't even know what day it is. Okay, today is the third, it's the ninth of Nisan today. So three big events that happen this Chodesh Nisan we have the conjunction of Mars and Saturn, Mars, Ma'adin, and Saturn, Shabtai. What does Saturn sound like to you? Shabtai, Sat, Shabbat, the Sabbath. Saturn was named for that. In Aquarius, this happened on Tuesday of this week. Early in the morning of the seventh of Nisan in Israel, that was the date that the children of Israel were first addressed by Joshua as their leader and preparing them to cross over the Jordan and enter the land of Israel, which they would do on the 10th of Nisan. That's a huge event. I'll tell you why, because of what Ibn Ezra and many other people say about the conjunction of Mars and Saturn. In Aquarius, they look at that as a sign of plague. Okay, this is, this is a, a source, not just from Jewish sources, but from medieval sources. It is well known, it is written, it is known, Khaleesi, that the conjunction of Mars and Saturn in Aquarius was the sign that the medieval people understood ha had something to do with their experience of the bubonic plague, which of course ravaged Europe and other places at different times. Um, so this happened this week, and of course we're living in times of the plague right now, and I am in no way saying that the astrological in, uh, influences are causative. Mars and Saturn are not making this happen. That is a reflection, it is not a causative. It's a reflection of what's happening, not something that's making it happen. So what is happening here this month, this Nissan, we have this. Then we have on Saturday, April 4th, which is the 10th of Nissan, the first of three conjunctions of Jupiter, Sedek. What does that sound like? Sedek, Sedaka, goodness, bounty, bigness. Going to be conjunct Pluto, the god of death and money. In Capricorn during 2020, three times. First one is April 4th. This week has got a lot of tension in it, people. And then we have the super full moon of Libra in Libra on Erev Pesach. 
okay, the day we slaughter the lamb and apply the blood to the lintels and the doorposts. So you see this connection between um, these three events. The sages, Ibn Ezra in his book, Sefer Alam says, this is what the sages mean by there is no mazal for Israel, as long as they observe the Torah. But if they do not observe the Torah, then the zodiac signs rule over them, as has been proven by experience for any conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter that takes place when Aquarius is in an evil configuration results in harm to Israel, God forbid. Those versed in astrology admit that a conjunction took place in a configuration, which meant that they would remain in exile in Egypt for many more years, but because they cried out to God and returned to him, he saved them. That is typical Ebn Ezra. He, said there, he says there is, but there isn't. So, okay, back to you guys. Hello, everybody. Wow, I've been talking for 48 minutes. That's kind of crazy. Um, so now, I would like to take any questions. If people have questions, you're gonna to have to unmute yourself and jump right in, okay? Anybody can, have? Can you say something about the full moon in Libra this year on Pesach? I can, is that Beth talking? Yes, yes. Hi, how are you? Hi, good, how are you? Baruch Hashem, I'm so happy that you're here, thank you. Yeah, yeah so the full moon, in Libra on this year is always opposite the sun. So that's not unusual. That happens every single year, but this is called a super moon because it's closer to the earth. Like this is the whole thing about super moons. It's such a pop um, phenomenon. So ast astronomers have always understood that there are times when the moon or all planets are either closer, slightly closer or slightly farther. And this is completely relative because they're in no way close or far. I mean, they're far no matter what, so they're not really close, but um, there's there astronomical points where they get to be a little bit closer, a little bit further away. This happens to be one of those points for the moon. It's a super moon. Also on that day, Mars is square to, Mars in, Mars in Aquarius, which we've already discussed as being problematic, um, squares Uranus and Taurus. This is a hard square between the two um, fixed signs. Aquarius and Taurus are both fixed, and a square is a hard angle. It's a 90 degree angle, and it's a, it indicates like internal conflict that has to be resolved through creative, creative problem solving, and you have to apply yourself creatively to these kind of problems, or you get stuck because 90 degree angle is a corner and you can't see around a corner without a mirror. So in this particular case, the way this is all playing out, this is all, every single thing that's happening right now all has to do with this whole cluster bomb in Capricorn, these degrees of Capricorn, 22, 23, 24, 25 degrees of Capricorn. If, you, if people have important uh, planets or important angles in their chart at that either there or opposite there by Cancer or square to that at Libra or Aries, they're experiencing some intense stuff right now. Um, also on the same day, this is like a huge day astro astrologically for Passover, Mercury, planet of communication, makes a sextile, which is a supportive um, angle to Pluto. Pluto there again, Pluto, Pluto and Mercury, when they get together, you can have some explosive words. So let's just hope that we, we use those words to transform and heal and not to, to harm one another. And then Pluto also makes a sextile to Jupiter. Okay, so Pluto, I'm sorry, not Pluto, that's Mercury. Mercury makes a sextile to Jupiter. So that should actually help things. Um, I don't know if that answers your question now, but you... Uh -huh. You asked me like what's the astrology of for the day well, I was wondering what the um, impact of Libra is on Passover and, oh. and the connection okay sure because Libra, Libra and Aries are opposite so Libra is Venus Aries is Mars and the full moon of Passover is always on in Libra so it is the, it, it always indicates the balance of, of Venus and Mars in the bigger and biggest picture of course I'm going to tell you that this indicates the um, 
perfect realignment and putting back into proper place the balance between male and female energy, the idea of Shekhinah being elevated to her place, and this idea that the whole universe is in, in balance in some way. And you get the same thing on the other side of the Jewish year with the sun in Aries and the moon in Libra. So on a spiritual level, this is what we're what is written about when we talk about that portion in the prophets where it says that take two sticks and on one of them write Judah, Yehuda, right? Aries. Basically it's saying putting putting Aries and Libra together for this the house of Joseph, which and and the house of David are put together and they become one in the hand of the prophet, and that is a prophecy about the Jewish people becoming one people. Um, so these are the these are the archetypes of 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 Israel in terms of how Israel has like a personality. If you take the Bible as literature, you have Israel. Israel has a certain personality. Then there's Jacob, sons of Jacob. Then there's Ephraim. He's spoken of. Ephraim is. Is the is the tribe associated with Libra? So Ephraim is a beautiful was a beautiful child. There's so much longing around Ephraim. There's this like archetype of Ephraim of of having a that God has has this desire towards towards Ephraim for Ephraim to turn back to him. It's a whole interesting That's study cool. in itself of looking at those those two things. So in terms of the full moon in Libra, full moon moon is the emotional self. Libra is is ruled by Venus. Libra is love. Libra is romance. Libra is partnership. So there's the paradigm also between the individual, which is Aries, and the partner, which is Libra. So it's a it's a it's a perfect balance and a perfect meeting of those two things of your own individuality and your yourself in partnership. And it goes that way also on the other side of the Jewish year, just in a different way because the sun is. Oh. the sun and the moon is the moon the sun is your ego self and the moon is your emotional self so during during passover your ego self and your emotional self are mars venus and on the other side of the jewish year it's venus mars now think about this in terms of what we do on passover and on on um sukkot on passover we stay inside we bring we bring out our finest wares and we display them we stay inside and on Sukkot we go outside we take all of our wonderful things and we build a sukkah and we bring them outside it's do you see how there's that that balance between the two and how they're enacted in that way mm. I hope that's sort of a I know all of that thank you so much so interesting you're welcome you're welcome Jonathan Seidel do you have a question you're raising your hand I do um I'm interested to know how you read the energy of a Parsha or uh, the, the essence of a Parsha in light of a particular conjunction or astrological movement of the week. So in other words, what we've learned about this advent of, of Nisan Aries right now is how is it conjoined with, with, with Vaikra, with purity, with contagion, with, you know, Kapara? I lost you, Jonathan. Are you still there? Did did you guys hear the rest of I I didn't hear what you said after Kapara. So, I don't know why. The universe will shut up rabbis, by the way, inadvertently. <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> no, I know it was some it was some demon. Uh, <laughs> or a witch. Or a witch. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say is how do we well how do we make congruent the parsha energy of any particular parsha with an astrological moment? Uh, that one can read very clearly. I'm sure Ibn Ezra must have stood up in his shul and given a drash, you know, when he I was doing he it. He probably did, along with many, many hundreds of other astrologers who are also looking at the Parsha very carefully. So, for example, might we say something about the Parsha, the coronavirus, and the particular signs that we're reading right now that you've so brilliantly taught us about? Can you say something about how we do that? Well, you know, we always read for however many years this has been going on, and let's just say, let's just for fun say a couple thousand, we read this Torah in a one-year cycle. I don't actually remember, because I might have been sleeping at the time, when we went from a three-year cycle to a one-year cycle, 
but I feel it was like in the very early years. Um, so yeah, okay. So we always read the Torah in a yearly cycle, meaning we're always reading the Parshas in the same order. And we always start on Simchas Torah, right? When we roll up the Torah and we read. So that means that every year we're reading the same Parshas over and over, but every year the, and, and every year the sun does the same thing every year in all the signs because it takes the sun exactly a year, 365-ish days to go around all 12 signs. So you're, you're all, we're always reading um, the same thing, but in terms of the, of the Parsha and the sun, but we're always reading it differently regarding all of the other planets and the cycles of the other planets. So every year will be unique and every year will be the same. Every year in Nissan, we're all going to be reading the, pretty much the same Parshas, give or take a Parsha, depending on the, on the year. And every year there's going to be something different going on in the, in, in the stars. And I think that's, you know, the Torah is endless. There's no end to it. There's no end of, of um, riches that one can extract from it on any given moment, any given day throughout all of time. So there, there's really no end of finding new Chidoshim and things in the Torah. And I think that if, if a person understands the cycles of sacred time and understands what's happening in the stars, there's always the application. I do a podcast every week that I talk about whatever's going on in the, in the stars that week, and I talk about the Parsha, and I try to relate the two of them to see. So I often find, um, I often find that the Parsha is just like reading the news, but better. <laughs> Um, where, where, where do you do that work, uh, Lorelai? Well, I, I have a no, float? no, I do it on, I have a podcast on Anchor FM and it's available on all sorts of other platforms like, like every platform in the world. Um, and I've been doing it for a long time. So you should check that out. See, I'm not doing a good job marketing if you don't even know that I do a podcast. I kind of have hints, but you, you're my teacher in marketing, so okay. you do a good job mostly. All yes, right. you do. I'll show you guys where I keep my podcasts in a little bit. I want to take more questions if anybody has something that they want to ask about this. Any questions about Jewish astrology or any of these things? I have a question. I need to go, but thank you. It was very, very uh, well done and interesting. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Can you, I have a question, Lorelai. Yes. Uh, it, it's back to the thing about Mazal. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, it gives me a different meaning for the word Mazal, because I always thought Mazal meant good luck. And here it means something to do with the stars. And, wow. and, and, and it seems like, um, Somehow, it's, it's not exactly a positive interpretation. And if we don't, uh, the Jewish people aren't, um, are immune to mazal, if what? I mean, it's like, well, bad things happen to us. If we pray and if we do the mitzvot, we won't be under the auspices of the stars or mazal. So I'm, I'm not really sure exactly what that whole thing means, but it just seems to me like it's significant somehow. Okay, so I'll, 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 answer, I'll answer that question by saying the word mazal literally means constellations. It's referring specifically to the astrological constellation. So when someone says mazal tov, mazal tov, what they're really saying is you should have good stars. Okay, mm -hmm. that's literally what it means. It's become... In, in modern life and the, and the way that we live now, it's become completely denuded of its actual meaning and its original meaning. So when people said, that said en mazal Israel in the Talmud, they meant specifically, that not that there's no luck for Israel. People, it's, an, it's a misinterpretation to say that mazal means luck. It doesn't mean luck, it means stars. Okay, so um, what I'm saying is, in this idea of, of, of the Talmud saying, Ein Mazali Israel, what they're trying to say is that the Jewish people are higher than the stars and that we have a special relationship with God that's going to preempt 
any kind of astrological influence. Well, okay, the laws of gravity still apply to us, even though that we're Jewish people. So do the laws of thermodynamics. So do all of the other natural laws that affect all other human bodies. So there is no difference between a Jewish body and a non-Jewish body, um, except for what they do to that body, but in terms of how the body is made up. So the, the, the human body is just as subject, no matter what whatever its heritage is, to the forces that control the physical universe. And since you're a woman, you probably know that women's bodies are very, very responsive to the moon cycles of 28 and a half days. Like we know from being women that we already know that we have a relationship to the moon, the tides, the physical earth. If we have that kind of a physical relationship with the moon, and you understand how big and gigantic the planets are, you understand how that will work together in this cosmic way, you understand that there is a relationship between these energetic archetypes that actually have mass and size, as opposed to like the sphero that aren't even real in the terms of physicality, that these physical things have their effect on the earth, tides, times, they're given to us for, for these things. But what you're trying, what I'm, I sense you're trying to say is, is there like an escape clause for us? This is what the rabbis would like us to believe. The rabbis of the Talmud want us to believe that if we're good and we are perfectly righteous, then there is no mazal for us, meaning that we're not subject to the limitations of our stars, that we are completely under the auspices of Hakkad Baruch Hu. And I think that in astrology, this is how I understand it because of the way I teach and understand astrology is that my whole point about being an astrologer and working with people is to help them understand themselves. The more a person understands themselves and the way that they are uniquely and creatively made by their creator and put into this world, the more they understand their own gifts and talents, the more conscious they are, the more conscious they are and connected to themselves and more connected to God, therefore less subject, so to speak, to quote unquote the stars. If the stars say you have a terrible temper because you have a really messed up Mars conjunct your ascendant and it's conjunct Pluto and all these other bad things are happening to it, how can you get away from that? You can't just say, yeah, I'm gonna be a murderer, tough, because it's my stars judge. You can't put me in jail. Look at my my look at my <laughs> natal chart. I had this crazy astrologer named Lorelei once who told me this. Um, so you can't use your stars as an excuse for behavior. You have to understand that the stars are put there for you to understand their meanings, how they apply to you. So let's say you are a person with a, uh, let's say a person, not you specifically, let's say there's a person with a terrible temper. They can look at their chart and understand through the language of symbols and archetypes why that might be and how that manifests and then learn to use something else besides their temper to express how they're trying to feel about themselves. Use something else that's also in their chart. Use their Venus, use their moon, use something else. So that's, that's the, the modality. This is how I work with astrology and, and helping people to understand that they're not limited by anything except for ignorance. When you're ignorant about yourself and you don't understand yourself, then you're just like all these sheeple, right? Sheep people who just are completely outward. They have no ability to have any kind of introspection. They don't understand themselves. Therefore, they're completely reactive and you can do anything to them. You can manipulate them. You can hire Russia to feed them false ads and then they'll vote for who you want because they're so easily controlled. Okay, so my whole point about that, and I think I, I agree with the rabbis and the rabbis agree with me. The more you know yourself, the more understanding, the more self-understanding a person has, the less they are limited by their natural wiring. But how can you know what your natural wiring is unless you look into it? It's a way to help understand oneself. It's a language. Yes, Barry. Were you I'm asking? wondering, my dear sister, um, I understand that the fault there, Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. <laughs> That we are underlings, but my question is uh, is really um, how did you um, how did you in your journey 
um, attach yourself to the Zodiac? Wow. Okay. So when I was like 12 years old, I had a, a very dear friend of mine, Robin Harrison, who's an Aquarius, and maybe one day she'll see this. I always like to give her this credit because on my birthday, she gave me a book. This book was called Linda Goodman's Sun Signs. It was a international bestseller. It was on the New York Times list for 25 weeks. It's the only astrology book that's ever been on the New York Times bestseller list. And it was very big in the 1970s when, when it was written, like 70, 71. And when it was just came out, she got it for me for a, for a birthday present. And I read it and I, my mind was blown because I was able to see and understand that there were ways of understanding myself and the people around me in terms of these symbols and archetypes and ideas that you could categorize people according to when they were born, but by personality types. And I was very, very interested in that. And then shortly thereafter that, I realized that there was more to understanding astrology than just sun signs. So I started to learn about everything else that goes into astrology, the moon, the rising sign, all of the different planets. And these were in the days, the dark days of the 70s, folks. Back then, there was no such thing as the internet. You had to go to a place like a metaphysical bookstore to find things like an ephemeris that has all of the listings of all of the planetary positions forever. And I, I, I learned. I learned the classical way. I learned by reading. I learned by doing. I started doing people's charts. And then in a crazy turn of events in 1986, I actually met Linda Goodman in real life under completely bizarre circumstances because my husband, his soul should have an, an Ali eyes, not in this world anymore, but he was a private investigator. And I, we ended up doing some work for her and I ended up spending a ton of time with her. And I basically interned with her for about four or five months. And that was an invaluable experience for me at that time. So that's how I got into astrology per se, how I got into Jewish astrology. I moved to Israel. All these from Jews were telling me, on one hand, this is forbidden. On the other hand, can you do my chart, but don't tell anybody <laughs> because everyone will be upset when they find out because, you know, Ain Mazali Israel. So I had a huge clientele. And basically, I'd like to also say that I still have a very large, thank God, Baruch Hashem, clientele of Haredi and religious Jews who understand the value of this but because of social and societal pressure can't recommend me to people because that would mean that they went to an astrologer so for i have a word of mouth business <laughs> which is predominantly my customers are people who don't do word of mouth so it's very funny very very funny um so when i moved to israel i was like no this doesn't make sense it can't be true that that astrology is a sore because there's so much evidence of astrology everywhere just like look at look at the art look at the architecture and i started studying and i started studying with people in israel i started learning kabbalah with with people teachers there i've had some very amazing teachers so i will credit definitely rob abraham sutton shlita he should live and be well as as my primary teacher of kabbalah when i was in israel but i learned with many other people and um learned uh, a lot from uh, Mattis Yahu Glazer Sims book um, Above the Zodiac, which is a kosher book um, approved by people because it's written by, written by, by a rabbi. Um, but it's, again, it's not a scholarly book. It's a, it's a religious book. Uh, and then I wrote my thesis on astrology in Jewish cultural history at, at um, GTU, uh, Graduate the Theological <laughs> years ago so I kind of come full circle I hope that answers the question Gary yeah how did I attach myself uh -huh. that's how it happened I got attached happened you were I got attached so does anyone else have any questions looking to see if anyone's hands are raised Jay Fraser I would like to hear from you Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I was looking at the tribes of Israel and the stars, mm -hmm. and I noticed in one of your drawings that you had Ephraim on the, on the east and Yehuda on the west, but... No, it's that's, maybe it appeared backwards to you. 
I'm not sure, but it's always, Ephraim is always on the west and Yehuda is always on the east. Right. That's what I thought. And so, okay, so in, in the astrological charts, um, when I look up at the sky, it's like uh, the constellations for the two are swapped over. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. So yes. how do you explain because I, I keep trying to rack my brain about this. Is that like a mirror? Yes. Okay. It's like a mirror thing. It's like a mirror thing. It's definitely a mirror thing. I know what you're trying to say. It's impossible. Thank to you. <laughs> Thank you. But it is. It's a mirror phenomenon. Okay. And also yeah. the time space and where we are at any given time, because the whole idea of, of, the, of the ecliptic is completely fictional. There is no such thing. It's... But it's something that we've believed in forever. We, there is no belt around the, the waist of the earth, so to speak. There's something called the equator, but that also doesn't have a physical manifestation. The ecliptic is this imaginary belt that, go, that the ancients, that we've been working with since the days of the Chaldeans and the Babylonians and the Egyptians. This isn't just our idea. This went back way before us. And the idea is that the ecliptic is divided into, into 360 degrees, mm -hmm. 12 signs of 30 degrees each. But everybody knows the constellations don't work like that. Some constellations are tiny, relatively speaking. Some are huge. Virgo is the second biggest constellation in our entire 88 constellation solar system that we happen to live in. But it still only gets 30 degrees in the eclip ecliptic, right? Right. I do have, um, I just want to say, I do have uh, Marit Yahu Glazerson's book, and yeah. I even have the, the big fold-out poster that I was in the too, back. I do, and you, you're so lucky because they don't make those anymore. I you know. know. <laughs> We're so lucky. I have that, too. I have it up on my wall in my kitchen. I use it all the time. I think you saw a photograph of it in my presentation of the, of the center part that has all the permutations of the, of the four-letter name of God. Yeah, it's yeah. fascinating. My um, Jewish yeah. studies really, teacher. He's he he he's a great writer. He's a little whacked out right now with Bible codes, so I try not to pay too close of attention to what he's doing right now. But his work on in astrology is impeccable, and it's quite old. I mean, I don't know when. I think it's like two thousand, two thousand two, or something that he wrote this book. Oh gosh, my I, Jewish I, studies I, teacher turned me on to it. She she let me come into her library. And I was like, oh, and so um, she let me read Capricorn because I was a little concerned with some of my issues. Oh, because of this year? Well, the Capricorn um, cluster bomb? Capricorn is a very depressing sign and I, I've, I fit the bill, but I have a lot of, I have like six Sagittarius signs in my <laughs> chart. Do you know your Hebrew birthday? Uh, yes, it's a Tevet, I think either 25 or 26 six my mom and i are like right next door to each other okay 25 26 so so moon and scorpio no or sag sag okay so we should talk offline but yeah the the Cap capricorn is Cap capricorn is one of the two signs that's ruled by saturn classically aquarius being the other one Right, so Saturn is the planet of the Jewish people, like Aquarius is the sign of the Jewish people. But mm -hmm. Saturn, um, like Aquarius and Capricorn, Capricorn is I and Aquarius is Sadic. They're kind of like mere opposites in a sense, but they're both ruled by, by Saturn. So be in touch with me. Do you know how to be in touch with me? My email, laurelaikudayahoo.com. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. I'm Jay Frey on Facebook. Um, oh. I've cut my hair since then. It used to be long, but yeah, I cut it. I went through a change, like oh, I'm happy to meet you in real a life. life change. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, good. So uh, there's my email. It's just my name, laurelaikudayahoo.com. I think everybody must know if you don't by now my my website, astrology. I can see if they're going to let me put it there. You know what? Facebook has not let me put my URL to astrology up since January. Now because of coronavirus. Right before coronavirus hit, I was like, I'm going down to Palo Alto. I'm going to stand in front of their building and scream until someone makes, you know, pays attention to me. And now I can't even do that. Now I'm just going to have to get lawyers and write threatening letters. Okay, so I'm going to 
stop the recording.